you probably have no idea how much of a privilege, uh, even literally a joy it is, uh, to be able to stand up here before you and before you uh, who are live streaming, before all of you week by week and try to say some word on behalf of God in faith. That's a joy. That's a privilege. Perhaps unless you do it, you also can't imagine the sense of responsibility uh, that you carry to this place and wonder, is it possible to do justice to the moment? Week by week, I pray a prayer asking God to be the preacher. This morning, I want you to pray. I'm going to bow our heads for a moment. I want you to pray that God will speak and pray for me. Let us pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've looked at the sermon title in the bulletin, uh, you probably can imagine where I had intended to go on Stewardship Commitment Sunday. Uh, I was going to introduce the sermon with a probably somewhat lengthy uh, uh, talk about Sally Field, who I think is a very gifted performer uh, began in kids' roles, you know, uh, a Gidget and Flying Nun, but then graduated to some really meaty stuff where she showed what she could do. Norma Ray, Places in the Heart, Forrest Gump, Still Magnolia, Brothers and Sisters. Last year, uh, I thought she should have received an award for a film about aging called My, Hello, My Name is Doris. Really gifted performer. Over the years, she has received so many awards, including two Academy Awards as Best Actress. So we were going to talk a little bit about that and, and remember together one of the things for which she is most remembered, which was her second acceptance speech. Remember? Her first Academy Award came for Norma Ray. Uh, Norma Ray, she thought they gave the, the award to the film, to the script, to the power of the role, but she thought they still basically didn't respect her, that they thought of her as Gidget. But the next time, for Places in the Heart, she suddenly realized, no, they are affirming me as an actress. And you recall the, the acceptance speech, how she stood there and she held the Oscar and she effused at the audience, you like me. You really like me. So we were going to talk about that for a little while. And then I was going to make mention of the fact that in this academy of daily life, God awards us with gifts every single day, no matter how, how uh, distressing or, 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 or discouraging any moment in your life may be, if we keep our eyes open every day, we are given blessing upon blessing. And if we are aware of that, uh, we say to God, you love me. You really love me. And then I was going to segue to Paul's words that you just read in 2 Corinthians, uh, where Paul says, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, which means enthusiastic, which means committed. And I was going to talk about how we give, and when we do so uh, cheerfully, with commitment, with enthusiasm, sacrifice, born of our faith, God looks at us and says, you love me. You really love me. Now there you have in three minutes an executive summary <laughs> of a 20-minute sermon. Well, don't get your hopes up. I woke up at 4 a.m. Wednesday following the election, and, uh, and I woke up not as preacher, but as pastor. I woke up reminding myself that all of you will bring a lot of emotion to church today. No matter who you voted for, no matter what party you're in, you're still going to bring a lot of emotion today. And maybe what you want from your pastor 
Today is not a word about church finances. Anyway, four Sundays ago, Chad preached one of the best stewardship sermons I've ever heard. The last couple of weeks, I've tried to add my voice alongside that. Last Sunday, Joanne Abersbach did a beautiful job lifting up the importance of stewardship. In a few minutes, you're going to hear from one of the members of our board, Trenisa Denuser, and knowing her, I know she will do an outstanding job with it too. So as your pastor, what I want to do for a few minutes is think with you about what you're already thinking about. And what an interesting moment this is. One of the things we have in common is that we are all unsettled, whoever you voted for. This is the first election, so we are told in the history of America, and all this is based on exit polls, but the first election where more people voted against a candidate than for that candidate's opponent. Interesting moment in our history. 67% of people coming out of the voting booth, whoever they voted for, red or blue, 67% said they are frightened for our country and its future. Why? Because we are divided. One candidate won the electoral college vote, the other won the popular vote. One party won the uh, majority of the House, The popular vote for House went to the other party. We are a nation divided, and we have begun to articulate, Democrats, Republicans, and everybody in between, that right now we're unsettled, we're frightened. We don't want a divided nation. So what what do we do about that? I want to say three things, and I'll try to be relatively brief, and, um, and I do so knowing it will be inadequate. A lot of us preachers have talked this week, and we know that whatever we say today, Some will say you went too far. Others will say you didn't go far enough. Uh, But I'll I'll just do what I think God is calling me to do, and then you do with it whatever you wish. I want to say three things. First of all, we need to retain a historical perspective. What we are witnessing is a moment in history. It is not the sum total of history. Our reality as a political people is that the pendulum swings. It always has. It always will. As it seeks a middle ground where most of us can live together comfortably as one nation under God. What we are witnessing now is the swing of the pendulum. A moment in history, but not the sum total of history. I was uh, in a restaurant Wednesday night following WeWo. And uh, it was was a little Italian restaurant in our neighborhood, lovely restaurant. Seats, maybe 50 people, if that. It was full with the exception of one little two-seater table right beside the bar, which is okay because it was just one of me, and, and so they led me to that table. And, and I was seated. Behind me were two women at the bar, maybe three feet. I could have reached out and touched them. Uh, I would have been arrested, but I, <laughs> but I could have done so. Uh, beside me were two couples having dinner. I could have reached out and taken their bread. Again, it would have been disturbing, but, you know, I'm that close to where I could not, I was by myself, I couldn't help but eavesdrop. I didn't try not to eavesdrop. It's kind of interesting, but (laughs) the women at the bar and the two couples at the table were discussing politics. Of course they were. It's less than 24 hours after the votes came in. Everybody was discussing. The two women at the bar were ecstatic over Tuesday's results. They were jubilant. They were basically saying loud enough to be heard that had Secretary Clinton won, the world would have ended. The two couples at the table were lamenting the fact, also loud enough so the women would hear them, (laughs) that because Mr. Trump was elected, the world had ended. (laughs) And I listened to that 
with a sense of understanding that the day after an election, the week after an election, for weeks after an election, there are so many emotions, and some of them are, are real, and some of them are raw, and some of them are celebrative, and some of them are grief-stricken, and you have to respect that. We, we have to be given a chance to feel what we feel, but they weren't talking to their partners at the bar or the table. They were talking at one another, and I found myself thinking, You have witnessed a moment in history. You have not witnessed the sum total of history. And you're both mistaken. Had the first scenario occurred, the world would not have ended. And because the second scenario occurred, the world has not ended. And the values that we cherish, whatever side of the aisle you're on, and the principles we hold dear, those core values and principles, they're still here. And the things that we want to stand up for and speak out about, they're still here. And America still moves forward needing our voices, but not needing our voices any longer, yelling at one another. Uh, the time has come to quit shouting at one another and begin listening to one another. The time has come not necessarily to agree with one another and say, okay, you're right, whatever but at least to treat each other with respect and civility. Otherwise, we are doomed. The time has come to realize we're not one another's enemies. We disagree. We can. It's part of our freedom that a lot of people around the world wish they had. We can disagree. We should disagree. But if we demonize one another... On, on the extreme right this week, we have seen instances of people uh, abusing people and demeaning people and, and, and exercising bigotry. And on the extreme left, we have heard angry rhetoric, the very kind of rhetoric that those people condemned two weeks ago, even using Nazi language. None of that helps heal. All of that makes us vulnerable. When we make enemies of one another, we open the door to our real enemies. Ah, uh, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, North Korea. We're witnessing a moment in history. A moment that calls all of us to do whatever it is we can, even if it's in celebration on one side or tears on the other, all of us to do what we can. Because the pendulum swings and it, things change, and those who, who celebrate in one election frequently weep in the next, and those who lament in one frequently dance in the next. But the important thing is to find that land where we can all say we're committed to our country and its future. Now, how do we do that together? And it starts with respect, and it starts with civility, and it starts with the extremes saying we need to listen to each other. That's first. The second thing is this. You have power. You really do. Uh, if, if you voted for those who were victorious, you no longer have to just stand aside and say, well, now I hope they'll do what we elected them to do. I'm going to trust that. If you voted for those who were not victorious, you don't have to just weep in a corner and say all is lost. The country still belongs to you. You have power. You have constitutional power. Part of that is the power to vote. We exercised that last week. But part of it is the power of the voice. We call it freedom of speech. You have the power to begin speaking loud and clear to your legislators at all levels because they work for you. To elect someone is to hire someone. They're your employees. So now you tell them, here's what I want my employees to do. If you do it well, we extend the contract. If you don't, we fire you and hire somebody else. You have freedom of speech. Use it. If we use it together, if we speak long enough and loud enough and strong enough and consistently enough, they will listen because they're employed by us. How do we do that? Uh, you began writing letters 
to your legislators, and then you write more, and then you write more, and then you write more, and you keep on writing. You begin writing letters to editors. You write blogs. Uh, you start at the local level. You bring in local community uh, leaders. You talk to them about starting a movement, a grassroots that bubbles up. About what? Let's pick an issue we all agree on. Republican, Democrat, red, blue, anything, anybody. Over 80% of all of us in America say now that we are dissatisfied with the campaign process as we know it. We talked about this Wednesday night at WeWo. Over 80%, everybody on every political stream says this is not working, it's broken. We've hired some people, tell them to fix it. We know it's broken. Part of the reason we're in such distress right now is because we are exhausted physically, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. We have been subjected to 18 months of an oppressive campaign that disheartened us. The longest presidential campaign in the history of Canada was 10 weeks. In France, they limit it to two weeks. Those countries do just fine. It's time for us to say, we're not doing this anymore. We've talked a long time about campaign finance. It's time to fix that. Uh, in the United Kingdom, if you're running for prime minister, there's a limit. You can spend $30 million, not a penny more. Now they say in the U.S. to be elected president, you've got to raise between one and two billion dollars, which means that there's at least the, the possibility that you're going to get a lot of contributions from a lot of donors who expect a lot in return. It's time to fix this. You have the power to do so. The presidential debates this year range from embarrassing on one end to alarming on the other. It's time, and we all agree, Democrats, Republicans, we all said that. It's time to fix it. You have power. Don't feel like you're vulnerable or victims. We, the people, have the power. The Constitution was written that way. Part of it is the power of the voice, freedom of speech. If you want to change things, say so and keep saying so. And right now, this is one place where all of us on each side are saying the same thing. Let's say it together. Fix the system. You have that power. But this last thing. This is a moment, as is the case with every election. This is a moment for people of faith to lean on their faith. It's so critical. People, that's the, see, the music of angels. <laughs> God apparently agrees. <laughs> this, is, this is a moment for people of faith to lean on their faith. And part of that is two things I want to say. Part of that is our faith in the powerful presence of God. God is sovereign. God is in control. God is in control of history. There are moments in history that worry us or excite us. We celebrate, we weep, but the scope of history, God is in control. Jesus promised, lo, I will be with you always. God's not going anywhere. God helped us create this dream called America, and it's still in the process of being created. God will be with us. God will not fail us. God will be with leaders in both parties. God will say to them, here's what you need to hear. Here's what you need to do. Some will listen, some will not. But God will be present, counseling us as a people, encouraging, inspiring, comforting, loving. Lean on your faith. You have a God who loves you and a God who who wants the best for this land of ours, and that God's not going anywhere. But part of being people of faith is being faithful. It means doing what we need to do to begin the process of healing in the land that we love. It's not easy when you're sitting at the bar of the table in that restaurant 24 hours later and your emotions are raw and real. But discipleship's never easy, it's just right. Now is the time to begin living our faith. Now is the time to begin saying, here are the principles of Jesus. Doesn't mean we agree with everybody, but it means that we act like we've heard what Jesus said. I want to share this with you, and, 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 and then I'll, I'll be done. 
Sometimes I think that, uh, that you are so close to the forest you don't see the trees. One of the phenomenon we've seen in our country in the past few days is that people on, on every end of the spectrum are turning to houses of worship, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, others, and are saying, help us now. Help us find out how to heal. Help us find out where to move. Uh, to me, that's inspiring that for whatever reasons, whatever motivations, people in mass are looking at places of worship and saying, what do we do now? How do we become one nation under God? I think there's a lot of hope there. Now, like I said, sometimes I think you're so close to the forest you don't see the trees. What do I mean by that? Since Wednesday morning before I even got to the church, I have been inundated with emails. Emails from you, emails from others, emails from as close as New York and as far away as California nationally, emails from as close as Canada and as far away as Australia globally, and I've received a lot of them, and they keep coming, and there's a common theme in them. I've received emails from each side of the political spectrum here in our country from a GOP leader in Washington who's asking our council on how to establish a bipartisan prayer cabinet moving forward, from a leader of the American Islamic faith who said, thank you that your church has always been committed to multi-faith issues. We know you will remain. I've received from all over the world and from every end of the spectrum, emails this week, what are they asking? Well, first, why are they writing me? Because they think Michael Brown is, is some power broker who can fix things? <laughs> Come on. Nobody thinks that, least of all me. They're not writing to me. They're writing to you. You don't realize who you are. You're the oldest Protestant church in America. I realized that when I had the divine opportunity to come up here and at least try not to mess you up. <laughs> You're the oldest Protestant church in America. Everybody in the Christian community knows that. You had Norman Vincent Peale and Arthur Caliandro. Everybody around the world knows that. When you speak, people hear it. And what you need to know is that in these past few days, I have been swamped with emails from the city and the country and the world saying, will marble lead us? Will you be part of the process now? We've looked to you for a long time. Show us what faith looks like. We need it. Show us what respect looks like. Show us what community looks like. Show us what society ought to look like. Show us what the values really are. Teach us about prayer and we'll pray with you. Teach us what Jesus said about love because we hear you talk about it so much, it must be real. What did Jesus say? This is my commandment that you love one another. And then he upped the, upped the ante by saying, love your enemies. And pray for those who have treated you spitefully. Martin Luther King said once, I am so thankful Jesus didn't call me to like my enemies, but he sure called me to love them. There we are. We're not called to agree with the other, but we are called to love the other. We're not even called to be converted by or, or subdued by the other, whoever that is to you but we're called to love them and to somehow create community. And I think I was surprised, but probably not as much as you are, by how many people in how many places this week have said to Marble Church, you were first. We've watched you a long time. Show us what to do. 
You want a stewardship sermon? There you have it. It's about something more crucial than keeping the lights on and the heat running and paying the bills. It's about responding to the call that God has placed at your doorstep for whatever reason and that people from a lot of places are also putting there. It is our moment to show the world what love looks like and to become part of the process of healing. We may not have asked for this mantle to be draped on us, but draped it is. And therefore, that text we read earlier is urgent. The Lord loves cheerful givers, committed givers, faithful givers, because the Lord knows a church can only do what its budget allows us to do. On this Stewardship Commitment Sunday, my beloved church, Stakes are high. But you are faithful. And God is good. And therein our hope resides. So, stewards of the gospel, this is the day to begin. This is the place to start. As we inaugurate the long journey to healing, and hope. May God make it so.